Hello, and welcome to lesson 6.4 on rational exponents and simplifying radical expressions. Um, this video covers quite a bit. Um, we're going to do a, a sort of quick review on exponential rules. So, you know, how do you manipulate exponents? What are the laws of exponents and things like that? Uh, and then we're going to kind of investigate uh, what rational exponents are. And by rational exponents, um, you see, remember, rational, uh, we see the word in that ratio, which means fraction, right? Or, well, you know, we're talking about fractions. So if I have, like, you know, x to the two-thirds, how do we interpret that, right? The power is two-thirds. Up to this point in your math career, you've probably only ever seen exponents that are whole numbers, like two or three or something. Um, or maybe, you know, we'll, we'll talk about negative exponents briefly and things like that. But have you seen fraction exponents before? That's what we're going to kind of cover in this video. Uh, we're also going to talk about... Uh, so something interesting about this uh, expression, uh, the square root of x squared... Uh, which we'll get to that in a minute, of course, um, but it's, it's, it's interesting. And that's going to lead us towards simplifying radicals, where, which is really the meat of this video, is where we're going, right? How do I simplify really nasty expressions? Like, yeah, I'm going to, let me go to all the fourth, here's a sneak peek. This is what the video ends with, yeah? So that's what we're going to end with over there. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to take baby steps, yeah? Okay. So let's get started. Um, so this is just the warm-up I'm assigning in class. It was just a review of exponent rules. Hopefully we remember most of these. Fingers crossed for all of them. I don't know. Uh, here's hoping. Um, but I'm going to briefly talk about these. If you need to review exponent rules, uh, I either have another video up or you can just look at it online. Okay? Uh, just ask and I'll point you in the right direction. So for number one here, uh, we're multiplying two bases together, right, A and A. Uh, and the rule for that is that you add the exponents. So uh, we, we add, we say A to the 3 plus 4, which is A to the 7, yeah? That's it. That's the rule. Um, again, if you don't really know why, I wouldn't suggest this video right now. I would go maybe look up why. Uh, follow out throughout. Follow throughout the warm up, and any of these you don't know, uh, Google it or look online. I don't know something, because uh, you need to know these rules and to be able to kind of access this lesson. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's go to number two. Uh, we've got a to the fifth over a cubed. Uh, so you know when you multiply, uh, you add the exponents. When you divide two expressions, you subtract. You say a to the fifth minus three. And so uh, 5 minus 3, that gets me 2, so it's a squared, right? Done, right? Uh, if you're wondering why, right, you say, oh, well, look, a to the fifth is, that's 5 many a's, and a cubed is 3 many a's, and so 3 of those a's cancel, I'm left with 2 on top. That's why that's a squared, okay? Uh, next one, they say a cubed to the fourth. Uh, when you raise an exponent to a power, the rule is to multiply those powers, to multiply those exponents. So I got a cubed to the fourth. Uh, this would be 3 times 4, which gets me 12. Uh, for this one, uh, I'm just briefly explaining this. Uh, a cubed to the fourth means a cubed times itself three, or sorry, four times, right? That's what that means. And each of these a's is 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Count them all up, that's 12. Another rule of exponents is when you have something in parentheses, and it's, it's multiplication within the parentheses, you can just directly apply the exponent. Uh, so the 2 uh, sort of comes on down. So I say, look, this 2 applies to a and to b. And so you can say this is a squared times b squared. Uh, this is just because a b squared means a b times itself. So a times a is a squared, and b times b is b squared, right? Simple enough. That was pretty easy. Uh, number five, uh, pretty much the same rule that works with division. 
uh, you can just sort of bring that three on down. So you can say this is a cubed over b cubed. It's really the same rule as the previous one on multiplication. Uh, number six, a to the negative one. Now this is where uh, I'm curious to see where students are at because about half of you know this one already. And you'll say that a to the negative one is one over a. It's a reciprocal, okay? Uh, the other half of you might have never seen exponent, negative exponents before. And I'll say the towards the end of this lesson, it might be a little hard to follow along if you don't know negative exponents at all. I might suggest looking that up on your own time or coming in and see me, okay? As a quick explanation as to why this is the case. <clears throat> A number two up here, you see this rule, uh, right? When I divide two things, I subtract. So if I invoke that rule, I'm going to actually flip that fraction. I say a cubed over a to the fifth. What that means is so I got a times a times a, and then I got a times a times a times a times a. Three of those a's cancel, and I am left with one over a squared, right? So, uh, and I'll just write this so this can stay. This gets me 1 over a squared. But the thing is, is via the rule above, uh, I can say that, well, this is, I subtract the exponent since so I'm dividing these bases. I say 3 minus 5, and 3 minus 5 is negative 2. So naturally, what we define negative exponents to be is sort of the reciprocal of that value. Meaning, right, if the reciprocal of a squared, right, is a to the negative 2, okay? That is uh, the reciprocal of that. And vice versa uh, is true. So if you saw 1 over a to the negative 2, uh, that actually puts it up. So you could kind of drag that up. That equals a squared, yeah? So, yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, don't get too confused on that. Uh, that's not even the main topic of this video. That's something that's negative exponents, which is not really this video. Number seven, say a to the zero, that's a positive one, because anything to the zero is one. Well, subject to debate is zero to the zero, uh, but we're not going to talk about that right now. Um, if you put zero to the zero in your calculator, it should say one, uh, but some mathematicians might disagree with that. Uh, number eight puts all of these exponent rules together. Uh, so you can see, you know, I'm multiplying them together. Um, so it's saying that, okay, this is a cubed, right, uh, times a to the eighth. So I add those. Um, I say, okay, well, three plus eight is 11. So this is a to the 11 over b to the seven squared. And when I raise something to a power, uh, then I multiply the exponents. And because it's a fraction, that uh, multiplication of exponents carries on down to both. Uh, in other words, what this becomes is a to the 11 squared and b to the 7 squared. Uh, we used that rule earlier. And then this simplifies further, saying a to the 11 times 2 over b to the 7 times 2. And so I get a to the 22 over b to the 14. And that is my answer here, a to the 22 over b to the 14, okay? Uh, that's evoking a ton of exponent rules, right? You're, you're adding them together, you're applying the exponent, and then you're multiplying, right? Uh, so it's a lot of them. Okay, let's move on. Uh, rational exponent, now this is, this is where it starts to get fun, all right? Uh, and so in this video, uh, about half this lesson I have students explore in class. So it's really just me giving you class time to think about it and try things. And hopefully somebody gets it and then either they share or we just go over it as a class to see, you know, who got it. And then if you did it, we talk about it. Uh, so I do recommend if you want an authentic experience with this lesson for the first time, pause the video and try these out. Uh, here, I'll scroll to the other, scroll to those two, so you should copy those down as well. Um, but there's no sense in me waiting for, the, for you to do that during the video. I'll just go ahead and show you how these are done, okay? But again, 
I highly recommend that you try this on your own first to see if you can figure this out. Um, or maybe watch me do one or two examples and then see if you can take it from there. So it says, using only exponent properties, find the following, right? Now, look, you may already know what an exponent of one half is, but that's not the idea behind this. This is saying, well, if I only limit to myself, I say, I don't know. I pretend I have no clue what fractional exponents do. What, how do you simplify these, right? But you'll notice uh, in these, especially in these first three examples, 9, 64, right? 9 and 64, 25. These are all really nice numbers. Uh, they all follow a certain pattern. They're all perfect squares, right? You say 3 squared is 9, uh, 16, oh, sorry, <laughs> that's not true. 8 squared is 64, and 5 squared is 25, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm say, well, what if I write 9 as 3 squared? I mean, that's equivalent, right? Numerically, 9 is 3 squared, and this is raised to the half. And so I say, okay, uh, 3 squared to the half. Well, the rule when I, when I raise something to a power, I multiply uh, the exponents, right? Uh, this is what we covered in the warm-up. So I say 3 to the 2 times a half. Well, 2 times a half is just 1. So I say, say 9 to the half is 3. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, and I'm going to just kind of repeat this process for the other ones, right? 64... I know that that's 8 squared, right? I know that. Um, and, and why am I really doing this? Well, I guess I'm seeing that the power has 1 over 2, and recognizing them as squares being a power of 2, I've got this forward thinking that, oh, well, 2 will multiply with a half to kind of go away. Let's just say 8 squared is 64. So 8 squared to the half is 8 squared times a half. Well, sorry, sorry. 8 to the power of 2 times a half, I should say, which is just 8. It's 8. It's right, 8 to the 1. Uh, and, you know, hopefully at this point, you know, you're kind of catching on to the pattern, the routine of these, right? Uh, 25 is 5 squared raised to the half. You do 2 times a half. You get 5 to the 1. So that's 5. Yeah? Um, okay. Oh, I don't like the way that looks. There we go. That's a nice five. Now, 27 to the one-third. Um, you see, 27 is not a perfect square, uh, but I wouldn't really want to use that anyway because if I'm trying to kind of get rid of that, I'm thinking, well, hmm, this one-third. What would you multiply one-third by to get one? You'd multiply by three. So... Uh, I say, well, 27 is special. It's different from perfect squares uh, in that it is a perfect cube. 3 cubed is 27, and 3 cubed to the 1 third, well, then that's 3 to the 3 times 1 third, which is just 3 to the 1. And so I get a 3. I say, oh, this is great. Yeah? You're starting to see a pattern, maybe. Uh, okay, I come down to number 5. I say, 4 to the power of 3 halves. Okay. Well, 4 is special because it's a perfect square. So I could maybe do that. I could say, hey, this is 2 squared raised to the 3 halves, in which case I get 2 to the 2 times 3 halves, which incidentally becomes 2 times 3 halves. As 2's cancel, I get 2 cubed. And uh, 2 cubed is 8 because it's 2 times 2 times 2. So I get 8. Oh, so now, hmm, hmm. 4 to the power of 3 halves gets me 8. It's kind of interesting, right? You have a fractional exponent, but a whole number. Uh, hmm. Okay, I move on to this one. Let's say 8 to the 2 over 3. Now, see, 8 is not a perfect square, but it is a perfect cube. It's 2 cubed. So you say, okay, 8 is 2 cubed. It's 2 cubed to the 2 thirds. And I keep invoking that property, right? 2 to the 3, that's 2 over 3. I get 2 squared. Of course, 2 squared is 4. I'm getting 4. Man, these are all just working out so nice, right? Look how lovely these are. Uh, every time I rewrite the uh, number with a base, right? So like 8 is a base of 2 to a power of 3, that ends up multiplying with the uh, exponent in the top. 
and then I, it's kind of gone, and I don't have these fractional exponents anymore. 125, uh, this one might be a little more tricky. So yawn break. <sighs> Sometimes it's just nice to take a good yawn. Um, 125 is actually 5 cubed, if you didn't know. Uh, if you've been following the general pattern, maybe you could figure that out if you weren't sure. Uh, and so I'm getting like 5 cubed times 2 thirds. This is getting me 5 squared, which is getting me 25. Cool. Uh, last but not least, we've got number 8 here. 9 is a perfect square, so we could say 3 squared is to the 5 halves. You say, okay, 3 squared to the 5 halves. Uh, well, that's 3 to the 2 times 5 over 2. Two's cancel. I got three to the five. Uh, what is that? I think it's 243. It's fine if you don't know that off the top of your head, but it's essentially 81 times three. Oh, I'm yawning again. Uh-oh, I shouldn't have filmed this video at 10 and then 10 p.m. But yeah, 81 times three gets you uh, 243. That's three times three times three times three times three. Okay. Um, now, maybe you've noticed a pattern here, right? Um, you have a 9, and you're doing something into it, and you're getting 3. You have a 64, you raise it to a power of half, you're getting 8. You got a 25, you raise it to a power, and you get a half, right? You, sorry, you have 25, raised to a power of a half, and you get 5. You might say, oh, hold on a second. I know another operation that does the same thing. Right? What could you do to 9 to make it 3? The same operation that you could do to 64 to get 8. The same operation that you could make to 25 to get 5. And that operation would be square root. Right? So seemingly, uh, based off those, a power of a half is analogous to taking a square root. Uh, and interesting over here, 27, is it, well, that's like 27 cube root. That gets you three. Oh, huh. So if I were to establish a rule for the following, a to the one half looks to, it seems to be, I'm going to switch back to red here, just to be a square root of a. And a to the one third, based off what I saw with that uh, 27, seems to be the cube root of a. And so, well, I say, well, a to the half, that's like a square root, right? Like a 2 is here. And then cubed, I put it like a 3 here. So if I generalize this for 1 over n, I can say that a to the 1 over n is the nth root of a. This is a sort of generalization of what's going on. Lastly, I've got this thing a to the m over n. And I might need to look more carefully at these four examples on the bottom to kind of figure that one out. Um, but you can see, you know, with four to the three halves, it looks like, so, so four becomes a two, and then two is getting cubed. So it's kind of like you're taking the square root of four, and then you're cubing it, right? Uh, because square root of four, that's gonna get me that two, and then I'm cubing it. Uh, and I have some other, you know, I could kind of see the same pattern in these as well. Uh, but if I take 125 and I take the cube root of that, I get 5, or sorry, this 5, and then that just leaves me with 5 squared. So it seems that, okay, when I have a to the n over n, uh, that top exponent, right, because you can see... Um, let me circle this with my laser again so you can really see it. See how this is 2 cubed? That cubed is coming from the numerator. This square is coming from this numerator. This square is coming from this numerator, right? And so it seems like, oops, flip the page. It seems like, well, I know that this is the nth root of a, but it's getting raised to the power of m. Right? I would say it's like I can, based off those examples, it's like I'm taking the nth root of a and then I'm raising it to the power of m. Interesting. Okay. 
Now, uh, this last little piece down here, it says prove algebraically that the nth root of a to the m is equivalent to the nth root of a to the m. I say, what the heck? What does that mean? Well, I say, I need to prove that these two things are equal, right? And I want to do that using properties of uh, exponents and this rule that I've created, this rule right here, right? Well, what is it, right? Um, how can I show that this is this? Uh, and again, I, I encourage you to really pause the video here and take a stab at this before I just <laughs> spoil the answer for you. Um, it's kind of fun. You have to use exponential properties. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with the right side. I've got the nth root of a to the m. Now, the thing is, is uh, I can use a few rules here. Uh, I could either use the rule I created, uh, this one here. Uh, I could also use this rule as well. Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I suppose I'll use this one since I already proved it. Or, well, I guess I didn't prove anything, did I? I just kind of made it up based off the examples I did. So it looks like the nth root of a to the m, I can write as a fractional exponent, a to the m over n. I said, what do I do with this, right? Well, um, hmm, hmm, consider, right? I think, I thought, I'm thinking. Uh, well, over here, 1 over n was this nth root of a. So I suppose that if I raise this to the m, then this is raised to the m. Is that right? So I said, okay, hold on. Let's, in, let's interpret this, right? Uh, so this is equal to this, which is also uh, similar to saying a to the m times 1 over n, right? And that's true, right? Uh, now, the thing about multiplication, uh, we have this rule, right, that a to the, I'm going to make up different letters, let's say x, y, uh, you could have written that as a to the x to the y, right? Because you multiply these. But if you could rewrite it as a to the x to the y, couldn't you also rewrite it as a to the y to the x, right? That's how I can. So I could manipulate this. And I could say that a to the m times 1 over n could be written, right, as a to the m to the 1 over n, right? Uh, because I would just be multiplying those. And so uh, from here, I say, well, based off this rule right here, whatever a is, right, or whatever this thing is, it just goes underneath the nth root. And so I would conclude uh, that this is equal to the nth root of a to the m. And I'm done. I say, happy face, right? I have shown algebraically using laws of exponents. I've, I've broken this up, right? Uh, this is one of the rules I created. Uh, this is just a basic fact about multiplication. m over n is m times 1 over n. And then a to the m to the 1 over n comes from those exponent rules. And then I kind of invoked this rule to rewrite it as that. And there it is. So interestingly, and so what you'll find is on the next page, a new rule for you to know, right? This is something to memorize and know. A to the power of m over n, a fractional exponent. This is the nth root of a to the m, which could also be rewritten as the nth root of a as a quantity raised to the power of m. And these are all the same thing. These are algebraically equivalent. And we've pretty much shown that, right? And there it is. Uh, so this is the new exponent rule for fractions. These, this is how you define fractional exponents. Yeah? Uh, cool. 
And now, so the next piece, this is for fun. Uh, I'm not sure how much time to dedicate class towards this because I haven't taught this yet. But uh, again, I recommend pausing the video and trying these out. They're kind of fun. Uh, so say, how do I prove these rules, right? So I've got the nth root of a, b equals to the nth root of a times these root. Oh, I know that, right? I've used this rule a million times before, right? The square root of, you know, 12. I say that's like the square root of 4 and 3. So it's the square root of 4 times 3. So that's 2 root 3. I've invoked that rule all the time. Can I prove it? Have, have you, do you know why it's true? I say, well, uh, so if, if I have the nth root of AB, this would be like AB to the 1 over N, right? This is based off that rule I had earlier. Um, or really, just this rule where M is a 1, right? It's AB to the 1 over N, okay. But then I know through exponential properties that that 1 over n, that power, can apply to both a and b, like so, right? This is a rule we talked about earlier. Oh, but then I just invoke that identity again. a to the 1 over n is the nth root of a, and b to the 1 over n is the nth root of b. And I did it. I say... Hooray! How fantastic. Uh, so this is proven, right? Um, we've proven that you can do this. Uh, you've been using this rule probably for a long time now because you use it in Algebra 1, but I'm pretty sure you use it before Algebra 1 as well. Uh, did you know that that rule basically is just, uh, well, this, this rule? Right? That's all it is. It's just this rule uh, rewritten. Yeah. Uh, you can also replicate this with this identity over here. As so you got the nth root of a over b becomes the nth root of a over the nth root of b. So see, the nth root of a over b, we can rewrite this as a single fraction a over b to the 1 over n, as I said, quantity. But Again, in those warm-up examples, you can just apply that power to the numerator and the denominator. But of course, by definition, a to the 1 over n is the nth root of a. And b to the 1 over n is the nth root of b. And we're done. So they're just kind of like simple little exercises in seeing uh, where these rules come from. They're true. I say, I say, yippee. Woo. Okay. Sorry, I'm taking my time. I'm very slow today, but I'm having fun. Okay, let's move on. So uh, that is what a rational exponent is. This is a definition, and we are going to use this rule again later um, as we talk about simplifying radicals. But before we get to simplifying radicals, it's actually an interesting thing we need to take a take a look at, okay? Uh, and oh my gosh, I could talk about this forever because it's so interesting. Uh, but we're going to say the subtitle is A Closer Look at the Square Root of X Squared, right? Uh, so it says, suppose f of X, reading this out loud, suppose f of X is X squared and G of X squared of X. Are f and g inverses of one another? Explain why or why not. And I will say something about a student response. Yeah? Because in terms of these notes, this is for you, not so much for me, right? Are they inverses of each other? Um, as we've kind of gone through these last, you know, two, three lessons, um, I think so, Right? Uh, when you square a square root, you get the same thing. And when you take the square root of a square, you should get the same number as well. So they seem to be inverse of one another, right? And we've also shown that, you know, if you take a square root curve and then invert it, you get half a parabola. So, I mean, it's not the full parabola, it's a half a parabola, so they're inverted, right? 
Uh, so, yeah, square root x and x squared should be inverses. Um, but are they really? And that's what this section is about. So, claim. Here's the claim. The square root of x squared is equivalent to the square root of x squared, which is all equal to x, meaning they're inverses, right? That's the composition of f with g and g with f. So it says, based off your answer above, do you think this statement is true or false? I say, I don't know. It's probably true. But let's investigate. It says, consider the following. Let r of x equal the square root of x squared. Also, I need to, I, just, I don't know, I just thought about it. Do not disturb. I don't want anybody disturbing me. Let r of x equal the square root of x squared. Investigate the claim by completing the table below. I say, hmm, okay. Let's start with zero, yeah? So look, I've got the square root of x squared. Let's, we're just plugging numbers into this, right? I say, okay, well, zero squared is zero, and the square root of zero is zero. Oh, well, that's easy enough. And then I say, okay, what is the square root of one? What is the square root of one squared? That is the square root of one, which is one. Oh, okay, wow. <laughs> uh, cool. Looks good so far. Square root of 2 squared, that'd be the square root of 4, which is 2. So, okay, so that's 2. Square root of 3 squared, well, that's just square root of 9, which is 3. And 3. I mean, okay, you say, Mr. Spake, uh, this is their inverses, right, dude? Like, I don't know what you're doing still. They say, maybe he left off those negatives for a reason. I say, hmm, I, let's say I got negative 1 in now, but I'm going to square that, right? Because I'm inputting this into this function. It's kind of a composition of functions, right? Square root of x squared, which I'm not simplifying. I'm just looking at that as a function. I'm going to plug in negative 1 and square it. And so when I do that, negative 1 squared is positive 1, and so square root of 1 is 1. Oh, oh, huh. Okay, so that's a one. Hmm, okay. Oh, don't do that. Do not do that. Uh, shoot, I've run out of space. Oh, man, i got to lasso some stuff. Say, round them up. I say, come over here. Round them up. Get these fellas. Round them up. Okay. I don't know why I'm talking like that. I'm sleepy. So, I plug in negative 2. Negative 2 squared is 4. Square root of 4 is 2. Oh, hmm, 2. I'll do it one more time. Square root of negative 3 squared is 9. And square root of 9 is 3. Now, hold on a minute. Really look at that table. 0 is 0, 1 is 1, 2 is 2, 3 is 3, but negative 1 maps to positive 1, negative 2 maps to positive 2, and negative 3 maps to positive 3. I want you to consider, we know a parent function whose table looks like this. Can you answer that before I give it to you? feel like I'm talking to you like Dora, but still, I mean, it's a video lesson, right? You're interacting with it. You're trying to learn. Um, what is this parent function, right? What is this parent function that even when it was negative, it outputted the opposite, the positive value, but it didn't do the opposite for positives. It looks like it always returned a positive number. That parent function would be called absolute value. Now, yeah, that's interesting because we've always said that the square root of x squared gets you x, right? The square root of x squared, that's just x, right? I mean, it just undoes each other. Except it's not. It's not x. It's absolute value x. And so, therefore, the claim that r of x equals x is false. That is not true. And so, is it, oh, wow, 
This is actually quite powerful, okay? Um, you've been saying this whole time that square root of x squared was just a single x. It was the linear function, right? But it's not. It's the absolute value function. And I'm going to show you something in Desmos. Uh, it says, by the way, it says take notes from your instructor below. And I will do that. But if you're not convinced, observe this. So I've got to type this. Uh, where's my keyboard? Hello? Uh-oh. Tools? No. Where'd the keyboard go? There it is. Uh, let's say f of x equals x squared, right? And we've got g of x. Oh, where is it? g of x. If I'm going too slow, just put me on 2 times speed, yeah? The square root x. Okay, that's beautiful. I don't care about this graph. I don't want to see them. Okay, but I want to tell Desmos, what if I take their composition, right? I want to put x squared into the square root function. So it looks like I'm going to insert f into g. So say, look, this is g of f of x. Holy moly, who's that? And you say that's absolute value, right? Uh, the square root of x squared, when plotted, gives you the absolute value graph. You can verify this by quite literally typing absolute value x. Oh my gosh, right? Uh, it's the same function. Right? See, that's black. So this is green, black. Green, black. They're the same thing. So square root of x squared is not x. It's absolute value x. And this is interesting. And so does this mean that they're inverses? Well, <laughs> hmm, right? R f of x, which equals, which one was that? Uh, what, what is it? x squared. And g of x equals square root inverses. Right? You say, well, inverses satisfy that f of g of x equals g of f of x equals x. Right? I mean, right? That's how you know two functions are inverses. But wait a minute. I, when I took the square root of x squared, which is, which composition is that? I gotta remember. Square root of x squared, that's g of f of x. I say, but g of f of x is the square root of x squared is absolute value x. And absolute value x is not the same as x, right? It's not. They're two different functions. X is a linear function. Absolute value X is the absolute value function, right? Uh, so on a technicality, they're not inverses, right? They're really not. But hold on. Hold on. I say, what if I... Okay, so I graph a parabola, right? I'm going to graph the parent function parabola here. And, you know, I think my iPad does it perfect, but does it do it? Will it do it? Hey, look at that. Uh, except it won't bend the right way. Okay, I'll do that. And you know what? We'll just erase these lines. Sorry, I'm just, ooh, it's just, it's so nice that the iPad makes perfect parabolas. It's just so cool. Okay, so that's my parabola, right? That doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Um, and I know that when I invert that, right, when I, when I draw it like this, it, you know, fails the vertical line test, so it's inverse isn't a function, right? But suppose I only graph half that leg, right? I say just from here and up. Suppose I only do that. So, uh, this is... So this is x squared, where the domain is x is in all real numbers. But this parabola, so this half of the parabola, 
is x squared, but its domain is x is greater than or equal to 0. Now I want to call your attention to something. The absolute value parent function, recall, absolute value x, and this has been a while since we've talked about this, is a piecewise function. And how is that piecewise function defined? Well, if you remember, it's x and negative x. But over what interval? It's x if x is greater than or equal to 0. And the other one is if x is less than 0. And I say, ah, hold on a second. Look at that and look at that. The absolute value parent function is x if the domain is only 0 to infinity. So, I say, wait. Wait a minute. Absolute value x equals x if x is greater than or equal to 0 by the piecewise definition. Right? By the piecewise definition. So then, so, I say, so, I say, oh my gosh, I say, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what, what is happening? I say, g of f of x, right? If I say, well, hold on, hold on, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself, right? If x squared, which is f, right? If f of x equals x squared, is restricted to x equals 0, right? x is greater than or equal to 0. Then, conclusion, g of f of x equals square root x squared, which equals absolute value x. But on that interval, with the domain restricted to x is greater than or equal to 0, absolute value x equals x. And so it works. Therefore, right, uh, square root x and x squared must be inverses on x greater than or equal to 0. Ha! And there it is. So uh, this is fascinating. Right? Is is I don't know. I just I love this. Do you not? Do you not just fall in love with this? Just elegance, right? Uh, we were so convinced that they're not, um, right? They're not inverses because they don't mean that doesn't satisfy the definition, right? Absolute value x is not the same as x. But then, if I restrict the domain of a parabola to only its right leg, its domain restriction which is x and greater than 0, matches the same domain restriction of the absolute value parent function when it makes it x. So on that interval, on x is greater than or equal to 0, they work. By definition, absolute value x is x. And so it all works. I say in the names of Todd Howard, I say Todd Howard, It just works. You don't know who Todd Howard is. That's fine. Uh, that's a gaming thing. Okay, that has nothing to do with math. He's not a mathematician. Okay, anyway. Uh, yeah, okay. Ah, it's just awesome. You just take a moment and stare and just really absorb that greatness. Yeah? So, okay. Uh, what is this leading to? Right? What are we actually getting at here? Uh, well, simplifying radicals with variables. So, you know, you've made this assumption that square root x squared is x this whole time, except it's not. It's absolute value x. And so, if we deal with sort of abstract simplifying, we haven't established these as functions, 
we're just looking at them as quantities, as variables, as things we don't know, then I need to keep it as absolute value X because I have not imposed any sort of domain restriction to make it X. Does that make sense? All right. I haven't changed any domain in any of these problems, so I have to keep the absolute value bars. So uh, we're going to look at some basic examples here of simplifying radicals. I've got the square root of x to the fourth. So um, I can manipulate these, right? I can say, okay, look, x to the fourth, or square root of x to the fourth. That is um, x to the fourth to the half, by definition, right? Because square roots are powers of 1 over 2. And so that's just x to the 4 times 1 half, and 4 times 1 half is just 2. So the square root of x to the 4th is x squared, and I'm done, right? Uh, another way you can think of this is if you say, well, what's the square root of x to the 4th? You're saying, what times itself is x to the 4th? Well, x squared times x squared. And so then x squared would be the root of that, right? Okay. Uh, so we try the other one, x to the 6th. Um, well, I can do the exact same thing. I could say, oh, it was x to the 6th to the 1 half, which equals x to the uh, 6 times 1 half, which equals x to the 3, right? And so, you know, there it is. Except, hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What if x is negative? Consider that for a second. Hmm. Hmm. Can we take an example? Let's say, let's put this in yellow. The square root of 1 to the 6th gets me the square root of 1, which is 1. The square root of negative 1 to the 6th gets me the square root of 1, which is 1. So 1 was paired with 1, and negative 1 was paired with 1. That's absolute value x, right? That's what that is. Uh, so, um, and I should actually probably extend this further. Uh, if you do this with more values, let's say like 2, right? If I say uh, 2 to the 6th, then that is, um, well, I want to be careful there. Sorry, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to word this well so it doesn't get too confusing, but I also don't want to talk forever about this. Um, you can skip ahead if I'm going too slow for you. Uh, if I do the square root of negative 2 to the 6th, well, the thing is, so that becomes positive 2 to the 6th because anytime you take a negative quantity, you multiply that by an even number of times, it becomes positive. And so that becomes this, you know, 2 to the 6th over 2 becomes 2 cubed, which is 8. And so um, what you have here is I'm just going to kind of label these points. Um when you plug in 2, you're going to get 8. When you plug in negative 2, you're going to get 8. So this, right, this is not absolute value x, but rather absolute value x cubed, right? Or I should say, uh, well, that's fine if you write it, absolute value x cubed. You're cubing the number, and then you're taking the absolute value of it. So this quantity, x to the sixth, is absolute value x cubed. And you might be saying, Mr. Spake, you didn't do that junk for the first one, so why did you do it for the second one? And I said, because I'm being careful. Because if my result here was x squared, if I squared a negative... I would force it to be positive. But pretend I don't have those absolute value bars. If this is just x cubed, if x is negative and I cube it, I get negative x cubed. The negative stays there because negative times negative times negative is still negative. So 
oh, that doesn't go away, right? So that wouldn't work because if I plugged in negative 2, I would get negative 8. But it's not negative 8. It's positive 8. It says absolute value bars are included. Okay, I keep going. I get cube root of x to the 6th. It's x to the 6th to the 1 3rd, which is x to the 6th times 1 3rd, which is just x squared. Right? And again, here, it doesn't matter whether you plug in positive or negative, because when you square a negative, it'll be positive. When you square a positive, it'll be positive. Uh, so no matter what, it's going to be fine. Uh, I don't need absolute value because it already is already positive, right? And then if I do cube root of x to the ninth, this is x to the ninth to the one third. This is x to the ninth times one third. This is x cubed. And so I'll say, okay, this is x cubed. But let's do the same analysis, right? Um, so if it's x to the ninth, oof. Well, hmm. Suppose I take, uh, so if you do cube root of 2 to the ninth, I'm going to get uh, uh, 2 to the 9 over 3, which is just 2 to the 3, which is just 8, right? But if I do the cube root of negative 2 to the ninth, if you multiply a negative 9 times, it's still negative. It's still it's negative two to the ninth, right? This is true. Um, and so I say, oh, okay. Then if that is that, then well, if I take the cube root of a negative, it's still going to be negative because you can multiply three negatives to get a negative. So then this is negative cube root two to the ninth. But I know 2 to the ninth because right here is 8. So then this is negative 8. So then these points are 2 comma 8 and negative 2 comma negative 8. That's x cubed, right? That is x cubed, not absolute value x cubed. So... With these four simple basic examples, right? Uh, only one of them did I have to use an absolute value bar. And so uh, here is sort of the explanation as to why. It's down here. Oh, boy. Well, at, least, at least we're getting towards the end of the video. Uh, I, guess it'll, I guess it won't be that long. It's, it's only like an hour and something minutes, I think, I guess. Not so bad. Not my worst. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, uh, I see that when I simplify expressions, right, I have to be careful of this idea of just, like, using fraction exponents. When do I put these absolute value bars? When, when does this happen, right? Uh, because some of them don't have it, uh, but this one did, right? And I don't want to test values every single time. It's going to be a just pain in the butt. So here's the rules. Uh, if the index of the radical is odd, you don't need the absolute value bars. So looking at these two examples up here, cube root, cube root, neither of those have absolute value bars. And the reason is uh, if you multiply three negatives, you get a negative, right? So there is never going to be this need for always positive, right? Uh, the always positive thing is happening when you raise something to an even power, and we'll get to that. But the idea is any odd root of a negative number yields a negative number. And this is because if you multiply an odd number of negative values, so whether it's three negatives or whether it's five negatives, that if you take the product of that, it'll always be negative so you don't, it's not going to be absolute value because it's going to include negative values, which absolute value does not. But then if the index of the radical is even, you have to be a little bit more careful with that one. Half the time it is, half the time it's not. 
The way you can recognize this, so if it's even, you have to investigate. Once you simplify it, if you have an even exponent in your answer, you don't need absolute value. And that is because putting the absolute value bars is redundant. Example, so over here, right, you have x squared. The thing is, is whether x is positive or whether x is negative, if you square either of those, you get positive and positive. Putting absolute value bars around that changes nothing. I guess you're welcome to, but why would you? Why, like, why would you introduce a more complicated operation when it's already simplified, right? x squared is always positive. You don't need absolute value bars to make it always positive, yeah? Uh, that's why. Uh, but the thing is, is if you simplify it and you get an odd exponent, so you had an even index, so you took like, you know, the square root of something or the fourth root of something or the sixth root of something, but your answer was x to an odd number, right? So you took, the, you took an even root of x to something, whether that's even or not, who cares? You took an even root of x to something, but you got x to the odd. If x is negative... A negative to an odd power is negative. But when you take an even root of a negative, an even root of a negative, that means, right, an even root, if you have like something times something, if you make these negatives, you're going to get positive. If you make them positives, you're going to get positive. The only way you could take something and multiply it by itself to get a negative is imaginary numbers. And we're not dealing with those right now. Yeah? So uh, because a lot of times we're just looking at real numbers or we're just graphing over the real plane, we do not need uh, absolute – or sorry, we do not need to deal with I in this instance. Okay? Um, and so you can see this example here. This is a square root, so this is even. It's an even root, but the power is even, so I don't, it's, the power of even means it's always positive, means I don't need absolute value. Here, the root is even, but the power is odd, which meant if you plug in a negative, you get negative, but you're not supposed to get negative. You're supposed to always get positive because it's an even root. So both results should always give you always positive. It's just that you don't need it on this one. You don't, you don't need the bars. For this one, if it comes out to odd, they have to be there. Okay? All righty, all righty. And there you go. Okay. Uh, on to the last piece of the lesson, um, which is finally on simplifying radicals, which is probably be the traditional thing you'd see in a normal YouTube video. Uh, and so this should go pretty fast. Um, I'm gonna talk about how to simplify these. And I've always found it hard. Like, so I've taught this, you know, twice now, because it's only my third year teaching, guys. Um, but I've taught this uh, concept twice for two years. And some students just get it right away. And then others, they just, they just don't. And I struggle with kind of explaining to students how it works because uh, it has to do with division and remainder and stuff like that. So what I did, what I did is I created an identity that I'm hoping will not confuse you but make sense as to how you can quickly simplify radicals without having to go through a bunch of hoops, all right, without having to use a million exponent laws, a way that you can just look at it and know how it simplifies. So I am going to take a minute to explain this. And I know it looks like a lot or looks confusing, but let me just explain. Suppose you have two whole numbers, right, two integers, m and n. Then the quantity of their division, right, m divided by n, you can express this as m equals nq plus r. Um, this is just basic 
division, right? So example, 9 divided by 2. How can you express that? Well, let me keep it permanent here so it doesn't disappear. 9 over 2 can be expressed as, um, well, sorry, not 9 over 2, but rather 9 is how many times does 2 go evenly into 9? It goes in evenly four times with one as its remainder, right? Uh, you've done this before. Uh, we've even seen this notation, I think, before. Um, but you see that this is M, this is N, this is Q, and this is R. So it was nine halves, but you see, oh, nine, two goes into nine four times evenly, and then there's a remainder one. So uh, here, this is kind of what this rule says. Uh, Q is the number of times it even goes into evenly, yeah? Uh, and then R is the remainder of what's left over. So the way you can say this is uh, A to the M over N is equivalent to A to the Q times the Nth root of A to the R. And what that means is... Uh, However many times this denominator goes into the numerator evenly, that's the exponent on an expression outside of the radical. Whatever is remaining, the remainder, is left inside the radical. Uh, I am going to do some more examples, but to illustrate this fact just right here, with that ex very same example... If you had a to the 9 halves, right, nine, 2 goes evenly into 9 4 times. So you can write this as a to the 4 times the square root, and it's square root because the denominator is 2, of 1a, a single a, because the remainder is 1, right? Uh, and here's why this works. So if you have 9 halves, if you say a to the 9 halves, then that's just a to the 8 halves plus 1 half. Would you agree? I would hope you agree, because uh, 8 halves plus a half is 9 halves. And then via exponential rules, you can split this up as a to the 8 over 2 times a to the 1 half. But then notice a to the 8 over 2 it's just a to the 4, and a to the half, we interpret, is as the square root of a. And so this is what I've had to do, like every, this is what I've taught in the last years, but I'm hoping that maybe this kind of makes more sense, because like you'd have to split up the fraction every time, and a lot of students got confused by that. I don't know if this is better or if this, <laughs> if this is worse, so I'm just going to see how you guys take to it. Um, but this is how you do it quickly. See how many times the denominator goes into the numerator. Whatever that quotient is, put that on the outside. Whatever the remainder is, keep that on the inside. Uh, and as a little a note, a little asterisk, keep in mind, if you're taking an even root, don't forget all that stuff we just said up here. Um, if you take an even root and then you get this quotient is odd, then you need an absolute value bar on it, okay? For the same reason, all the stuff we just talked about. Okay, so here's some examples. Uh, I think we're going to switch to blue now, right? Yeah, sure, why not? Let's do blue. So it says simplify each radical expression. So the way you deal with these, right, um, is uh, 12. You, you can simplify square root of 12 the same way you always have. You can separate all four of these, or sorry, all, all four, all three of these using this property of radicals, which, by the way, we proved earlier, remember? It was all the way over here, right? Uh, we said that you can split up radicals with multiplication like this. So that's allowed. So then uh, square root of 12, right? 12, that's just 4 and 3. So square root of 12, that's square root of 4 times 3. Uh, so that's square root of 4 times square root of 3. So that's 2 root 3. Done, right? Uh, but then square root of x to the 4th, well, 
if you think about this rule here, right, um, how many times does n go into m evenly, right? So you're writing this as, uh, right, this is times, sorry, I'll just, I'll just put a bar here to separate these. Um, this is x to the fourth to the half, right? Um, so, oh, okay. Also, I should have written... That's what I meant to... Oh, that's what I meant to type. Okay. Uh, add this to your notes. Um, the nth root of a to the m equals this. The idea is that you can just look at this and go here. Yeah? Uh, I mean, if you write this, that's just extra work. Because a lot of times you start with this, and you say, how do, you, how do students do this mentally? This. That's what they're doing. They're saying, how many times does n go into m? Q many times, remainder left over. Okay? Uh, so here, uh, x to the fourth to the half, well, that just is... Oops, go back to blue. That's just x to the 4 times a half. This is x to the 2. Uh, but then if you use the shortcut on this one, right? If you say, okay, this is the square root of y to the 6th, then that's just y cubed. Because 2 goes into 6, right, 3 times. So you can kind of just say that this is y to the 6 over 2, so it's y cubed. But, 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 this was an even index. By even, it was 2. But the result was odd power. And because of that, we need absolute value bars. So we get that. Okay? Put all of this together, and the answer for number 1 is 2x squared absolute value y cubed square root 3. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're in algebra 2, all right. This is awesome. This is great. Okay, let's move on. And I'm going to just kind of in start invoking that rule a little bit more, okay? So q root of 32, 32 is 8 times 4. So then the q root of 32... It's just the cube root of 8 times 4, right? So that's just the cube root of 8 times the cube root of 4. So that's just 2 cube root 4. That's what that is. So it's really ugly. I'm going to erase that because, ugh, I don't erase it now. So cube root of 8 times cube root of 4, which is 2 times cube root of 4. That's what that is, Okay. Now, what about cube root of x cubed? Well, cube root of x cubed, how many times does, this is what I'm asking, how many times does 3 go into 3? Once. And is there a remainder? No. So, it's x to the 1. That's it. Also, you know that cube root of x cubed is x to the 1. So, there's that too. Uh, but this is where that rule might be really helpful. If you say cube root of y to the 7th, how many times does 3 go into 7? Twice. So 3 goes into 7 twice. But then there's a remainder of 1, right? 3 times 2 plus 1 is 7. So that's the power out here, and the remainder is what's left inside. It's square root of y. And so I put all of this together. And keep in mind, all three of these are being multiplied, right? Right? Uh, because I just separated them individually so I could kind of analyze them. 2x and y squared are on the outside. So 2x and y squared are on the outside. On the inside, by the way, that's cube root. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Uh, on the inside, so times cube root of, there's a 4 right here and a y. So this should be 4y. Okay, And I don't use absolute value on x. It's not absolute value x. It is not because this was an odd index. So if it's an odd index, not necessary. 
Okay, one more. Uh, this is 75, so we're going to break down 75 into 25 and 3. So the square root of 75 is the square root of 25 times the square root of 3. So that's 5 root 3. Yeah? Let's keep using that rule. Square root of x to the 13. The thing is, is the square root, the index is 2. So how many times does 2 go into 13 evenly? 6 times. And the remainder is 1. Is it is that starting to help some? The more you do it, maybe? Uh, 2 goes into 13 6 times, because that's 12, and you have 1 left over. Uh, this is... So I, I prefer... Uh, I, I should say I prefer... The thing is, is the way I taught it in the past, is I said, okay, well, what you got to do is you got to say, uh, this is square root of x to the 13 is x to the 13 over 2, and that's x to the 12 over 2 plus 1 over 2, and x to the, so that's x to the 6 plus 1 over 2, so that's x to the 6 times 1 to the 1 half, and then that's what gets you that answer. Yeah? But I figure that that is much, much faster. Okay? Uh, so let's take the square root of y to the 10th. How many times does 2 go into 10? Uh, evenly, uh, five times. So it's y to the fifth. But because that's odd, we put absolute value bars. Yeah? Even index odd power on result, <laughs> I should say. And so that's why that's there. And so I have... Uh, 5 root 3, so, okay, so it's this result, and this result, and this result. Uh, on the outside, you should have 5x to the 6th, absolute value y to the 5th. And then on the inside of the square root, you should have a 3x. And those are my examples. Yes. Just tackle them one by one, okay? Uh, it looks intimidating all at once, but just go one by one, it's not so bad. Okay, last segment of the video, and we can get out of here. I say, get out of here, Mr. Spake. I could just pause and leave and just not even want. I said, I know, but uh, what I mean by get out of here is that I go sleep. Um, it's okay. I'm having fun. I really am. I enjoy doing these videos, guys. I do. Okay, uh, last few examples. So simplifying expressions using laws of radicals and exponents. So uh, you're going to need this for the homework. Uh, so I, I hope that I get through this during class, uh, that we have enough time because I think it's been an hour and 10 minutes. Class is 90 minutes. And so, I mean, I guess, I guess, I guess it'll work. Uh, just doesn't leave a lot of time for anything. Anyway, example one, dealing with negative exponents in the range denominator. Does this really have anything to do with rational, or sorry, um, yeah, rational exponents or radicals? Eh, not really. This is more of an Algebra 1 thing, but it's going to be good review because you're going to need to be able to do it, okay? So remember with negative exponents, right, uh, just, just something to remember. x to the negative 1 is 1 over x. You know what? Let me not use x to confuse everybody. Let's just do a. a to the negative 1 is 1 over a, and 1 over a to the negative 1 is a over 1. So the idea is you just flip it up top, right? So if it's a to the 1, you put it on bottom. If it's 1 over a to the negative 1, you just put it on top. So that's a really easy way to do negative exponents. So uh, I say, oh, I've got x squared, y to the 7th, z to the negative 4, over x to the negative 3, y to the ninth, and z. Well, the thing is, is this x to the negative 3 goes up top, and this z to the negative 4 goes on bottom, right? Because that's how negative exponents work, right? They're reciprocals. So uh, they, just, they just switch, numerator, denominator. So I get this. So I get x squared times x to the 3, positive 3, not negative now, times y to the 7th over 
z times z to the positive 4. And that's just using simple rules. 2 plus 3 is 5. And I get y to the 7 over z to the 1 times z to the 4 is z to the 5th. And that's my answer. That's like the first box I've drawn all video. Yeah. Cool. I don't really know what else to explain there. That's how negative exponents work. <laughs> uh, go watch additional videos and you help with that. All right, rewrite the expression t to the 3 halves to the negative 1 in radical form. You do not need to rationalize the denominator. So the purpose of this example is just to kind of get you, like, understanding how to interpret these things. Um, You'll have, like, one homework question that asks that. But you'll need to use this skill throughout various problems. Uh, so I say t to the 3 halves to the negative 1. Well, um... I guess there's a few things you could do. You could say that t to the 3 halves to the negative 1 is, well, if you multiply them. Uh, did I type this wrong? Uh, did I mean negative 3 halves? I think that's what I wanted to have. But, okay, I guess I messed this one up. I think I meant to write t to the negative 3 halves, so you could say, oh, well, what's that, right? But um, whatever. T t <laughs> this is t to the negative 3 halves. Um, so I'm actually going gonna, gonna to write that, okay? t to the negative 3 over 2 is t to the 3 over 2 to the negative 1. But the reciprocal, right, if, if it's... 1 over, sorry, a to the negative 1 is just 1 over a. So you just take this thing and shove it on bottom. It's 1 over t to the 3 halves. And that's just 1 over square root t cubed. Okay? Uh, we, did, we stated here you do not need to rationalize the denominator. It was just to kind of interpret uh, that. Okay, so actually, uh, for the purpose of the notes, I'm actually going to fix that. Uh, I guess that's what I had last year or something. I don't know. So we're gonna we're gonna scratch that out. And we're gonna say right t to the negative three halves in radical form. Okay. All right, I like it. Example three. So it says rewrite radicals using exponential rules to simplify. Uh, so we have this radical thing down here, okay? Now, <laughs> I love this problem. I made this problem, so I guess I'm biased. Uh, but it says rewrite using rational exponents. So here's the strategy, right? So I say, okay, square root of x to the fifth over cube root of x to the seventh. Square root of x to the fifth, if you use the rational exponents rule, which, again, uh, this, it says nth root of a to the m is a to the m divided by n, right? That's my rule. So this is x to the 5 halves. And on bottom, the index is 3, so it's x to the 7 thirds. Now, exponential rules say that when you take, uh, when you have, you know, a base over itself, you subtract the exponents. So this is x to the 5 halves minus 7 thirds. But that is 4th grade? What is that? Uh, what's 5 halves minus 7 thirds? Well, you have to get a common denominator, right? <laughs> so you say uh, 15 over 6. I got that by multiplying by 3 on top and bottom. Minus, and then you do 2 on top and bottom for the other one. So 2 times 17 is 4. 2 times 17. 2 times 7 is 14, and 2 times 3 is 6. And so this gets me uh, x to the 15, right? So that's just 1 sixth. Uh, and so you could say that, uh, which is also equivalent to the sixth root of x. Uh, and so you could just say, hey... That's the answer. Yeah? 
That's the answer. So isn't that, I mean, that's kind of nice, right? Uh, this ugly looking thing simplifies to the sixth root of x. Not so bad. Cool. Okay, last but not least, example four, simplifying mastery. And so this is just labeled so because you're going to, um, oh my gosh, it's just getting, you're just using all the rules, like all of them, okay? Uh, and just simplifying the full thing. And you might want to use some rational exponents as part of your process. So the way I'm going to split this up is everything's being multiplied. So like you can, you can, you can break all of that up. Right? You could break all of that up. I'm not actually going to leave it like that. But that's what I'm saying is you can break all of that up. And then through multiplication and division properties, you could just pair these and then pair these and then pair these. So and then there's also a rule that remember square root of A over B is the square root of A over the square root of B. So if I have the square root of 60 over the square root of 3, I can write that as the square root of 60 over 3. That's what I'm getting at here. So let me erase that and then write it nice and clean. Uh, I'm just using various rules. The first thing I'm going to do is split up all my square roots. It's the square root of 60 times the square root of x to the fifth times the square root of y to the eighth over the square root of 3 times the square root of x times the square root of z to the 10th, okay? And then I'm going to group these square roots if I can. Um, so there is a rule. I'm going, to, I'm going to put a little asterisk here, right? The square root of a over the square root of b is the square root of a over b. And so I'm going to use that for a couple of these. The first two, this is equal to the square root of 60 over 3 times the square root of x to the 5th over x times uh, y to the 8th. And I'm just going to leave this in terms of multiplication, times 1 over square root z to the 10th. Okay? Uh, just, just, just to have that there. Okay? Let's simplify this. Uh, 60 over 3 is just 20, so that's square root of 20, times square root of x to the 4th, times square root y to the 8th, times 1 over square root z to the 10. Okay? And now that I've kind of simplified some of those, let's go through all of them, right? So square root of 20, uh, 20 is just 4 and 5. So square root of 20 is square root of 4 times square root of 5 is just 2 root 5. So this is 2 root 5. And then... Uh, I'm going to use, remember, this rule over here that we came up with about this, okay? Uh, let's just use that rule. <clears throat> um, so 2 goes into 4 twice, so that's just x squared. 2 goes into 8 four times, so that's just y to the fourth and times 1 over 2 goes into 10 five times, so it's z to the fifth. But because it's, so remember, all three of these were even index, indices, index, plural. Um, and when you deal with an even index, you might have absolute value. These results were uh, uh, even, so if you put absolute value around them, it's redundant. Because if you raise a negative to an even power, it's positive. So you don't need to force it to be positive. But the z raised to the fifth, if z was negative, that would not be positive. And we need it to be positive because we took a square root of z to the tenth. So this must be absolute value. And so if I kind of clean all this up and put it together... I should have, uh, all that stuff is in the numerator, 2x squared y to the fourth root 5 over absolute value z to the 5. And you can see that all it really was was just breaking it apart piece by piece. 
uh, when you do one at a time, it's not so bad. Uh, but if you look at it all over, it's, it's kind of intimidating. But yeah, uh, you do enough of these, you'll get to the point where you can do it pretty fast mentally. Um, and oh my gosh, guys, we did it. Is that like an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and 30? I don't know, but I feel great. I'm happy we did this. Okay, uh, well, that's enough of my lethargy tonight. Lethargy? Lethargy? I mean, you'd say lethargic. Would you say lethargy? I think it's lethargy. Whatever. I'm slow as molasses, and I'm sleepy, but I hope it was helpful. Uh, we covered a lot in this video, uh, so just, you know, if you got questions, let me know, and there it is. Have a wonderful day or morning or night or whenever you're watching this, and I'll see you later.